Good afternoon. <laughs> so, <clears throat> continuing our discussion from this morning on Mahamudra meditation. Meditation in Mahamudra tradition is um, taught as uh, being the process of familiarization. Familiarizing with our own mind and its nature. Meditation is not meditating on something else, on, on anything. Rather, meditation of Mahamudra lineage saying, Gomba main, gomba in, gomba long do your main. Meditation is not meditation, it is familiarization. Meditation is the full perfection of familiarization. Gom, gom, zawade. Mix it, gom, you can't hear your mother. Zawade. So, Milarekha is teaching here that. When we say meditation, there's nothing in particular that we should be meditating on. Or there's nothing in particular that we need to be cultivating in this process. So what is it then? It's familiarization becoming familiar with and accustomed to one's own mind. So, Milarepa is playing on words in this verse <coughs> because the Tibetan word for meditation is gong and the, the word for familiarization is gong. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> gong and gong. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Rangi semte marangi. Tene yapu moshiba. Juyu chapa. Tala kombas. So when we recognize well our own mind and become accustomed to it, this is what is being referred to as familiarization here. From, from this uh, <clears throat> teaching on, or from Melarepa, it is clear that when we meditate, we are not trying to become accustomed to something other than our own mind. We are not trying to import anything from outside. We're not trying to get used to some other way of thinking or, or other forms, sounds, culture, and so on. But in fact, it is getting to know our own mind a little bit more deeper. First of all, We don't know our mind at all because we never spend time to sit and look at our own mind in general sense. Secondly, even if we do that, we still get caught up. We still get caught up with the concept of meditating on something. 
always <clears throat> meditating on something, always thinking we need to do something. Right? That's what we do when we meditate, right? <laughs> when we sit and meditate, we always think we need to do something. Rather than being with our own mind, we're thinking we have to do something. We have to think about something. Uh, we have to change something. From a motor point of view, that's not healthy. <laughs> it's not a healthy meditation. <clears throat> and uh, the instruction of Mahamudra is saying that we have to be with our mind. Get to know it a little bit more. I think that's a good music for that. <laughs> you get to know it a little bit more and then go deeper. You know, deeper. Penetrate. Penetrate the heart essence of this <clears throat> mind and its nature. And that is what we call meditation here. And meditation does not require for us to do anything else from Mahamudra point of view. Therefore, getting accustomed to know our own nature of mind is the actual meditation. And when we the young taba Tartumba, one to Jura Kapsotani, long to Jura, Devo, Devo de Jay. When we fully perfect such familiarization, then this is called gaining mastery in meditation. That's mm -hmm. the resultant stage. Go long to Jay on the Gomba de Tengue. Milam Yimber, Chairman of Gombalong, the Jumay and Samore. Sam Ginello, Saldon Yame, Dadon Yame, Mosum to Jura comes with the Gombalong. Gomba, Gombalong. Milarepa sings about this in his song called The Eight Kinds of Mastery. He sings about <clears throat> what it means to gain mastery in meditation, or what meditation is as mastered as it can be. And this means not seeing appearance and emptiness as differing, not seeing bliss and emptiness as differing, and not seeing clarity and emptiness as differing. When we don't see these things as being different, then we have gained full mastery of this familiarization. So, <clears throat> when we meditate, you know, what do we mean by meditation here in Mahamudra is simply not being distracted. Mind that is not distracted, and relaxed at ease is what we call meditation. And that meditation, a true meditation on Mahamudra has to do, has to go beyond meditation beyond the thought of meditation, idea of meditation. From this point of view, if we are sitting there with a thought and idea of meditation, then we are not meditating. You know, we are thinking about meditation. We are contemplating on meditating. 
but we are not meditating. There's on the gome gomba And that's why it's that non-meditation is the supreme of all meditations. Um, This on the Jagjin Jigom 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 And that's why in the context of Mahamudra, the meditation is taught to be non-meditation. Jigom 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 when we meditate in the context of Mahamudra, we should be free from thinking, um, I'm going to meditate, or I'm going to take, meditate this way or that way, but rather we should just rest our minds in their natural state. We relax at ease. We relax without any contrivance. We let go and relax within the essence of and nature of mind. Thing on the nebic also, the name Gomcha Gomji Jitamakai Gomu. And when we relax, this one's a charging to Gomji Kauso, and then Tomar, Mama Devam, Magumbi Nuna, or Tanga Gomji Samba, the bottom Jimmy Tango and Mato, you should go back up with me. So when we practice Mahamudra and Dzogchen, it's taught that the only level of thought we need is a simple intention at the beginning, before we even sit down, that thinks, I'm going to meditate. And having had that intention, um, having formed that intention, we don't need any other um, intentional thinking at all. We just let go and relax in our, own, in our mind's own natural state after that. Mm. Uh, meditation is teaching us, is saying, just do it. Don't talk about it <laughs> too much. Don't think about it too much. Just do it. And that's what it is saying. <clears throat> Many years ago, you know, <clears throat> um, in San Francisco, <clears throat> When I was driving with some of my friends here from the Silicon Valley, we were listening to radio, and the radio station's uh, slogan was, it? Mm-hmm. was uh, "Light Rock, Less Talk." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Light Rock, Less Talk. <clears throat> when I heard this, it, it sounded like a meditation instruction. <laughs> Let's talk. That's what we need. <clears throat> and let's thought about meditation. That's a concept about meditation. Just have to sit and be there. Relax, at ease. So that's the basic <clears throat> characteristics of Mahamudra meditation, which is also reflected in the lineage supplication we chanted earlier where it says the um yang me gom ji mor mu shi song ba xin in the supplication to the tako kagyu if we translate the tibetan text literally um there is a line that says non distraction is the actual practice of meditation and what we, what we chant is um, awareness is the body of meditation. Awareness, non-distraction, the same. <clears throat> is the body of meditation or uh, the actual practice or the main practice of meditation? <clears throat> you know, the actual meditation, main practice is what? Non-distraction, simple. 
simply have to be non-distracted and within that non-distraction just relax and let go. No simple. <coughs> That's easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's, uh, it's, it becomes hard if you leave it as a theory. It becomes hard if you don't try. It becomes hard if you just think it's hard. But if you try, like, let's talk. That slogan, light rock, let's talk, like that. <laughs> if you just do it, if you try, if you give it a shot, again and again, it's not hard, it's not difficult. You know, more you think about it, more you prepare to do it, harder it becomes. Of course, you need a good understanding at the beginning, but once you have the right grip of understanding these instructions, then the only thing you need is just to do it, keep doing it. Shantideva says, everything will become easy with familiarity. Everything. Everything that looks hard, impossible, becomes easy and possible. Uh, when we become familiar with it. <coughs> Yes. Young ni young to When we habituate ourselves to it again and again. It becomes easy and possible. Um, I use this example of learning how to drive. Can you remember at the beginning when you learned how to drive? You know, especially if you did that with your parents. <laughs> it's harder. <laughs> or elder brothers. <clears throat> well, when we learn how to drive at the beginning, uh, instructor, you know, when they say, oh, look straight ahead on the road, and also you have to look in the rear view mirror, also you have to watch the two side mirrors. You know, when you hear those kind of instruction, it seems almost impossible. When you look front, you forget to look back. When you're looking in the rear view mirror, your car is going somewhere else. <laughs> and forget about the side mirrors. And, uh, uh, and of course, you know, you're holding it very tight, you know. Your muscles getting stronger. <laughs> And uh, everything becomes so stiff and very rough, right? And at that moment, it feels impossible to do all these three or four things, right? Including listening to the instructor. It's almost impossible to listen, to drive, to look in all these ways, different ways. It feels almost impossible. But once we get used to such driving, come back up. Once we get used to it. <laughs> A good translation. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder why we get along well. <laughs> when we get used to it, you know, then not only we can look at all these things and drive and talk to our uh, friend in the front seat, but also we can talk to our friend in the back seat, looking in the rear view mirror. And not only that, you can also drink coffee. <laughs> uh, while answering your cell phone. <laughs> you know, if you tell that from the beginning, it feels almost impossible, you know. So therefore, many of these meditation, 
sometimes, you know, when we feel, it becomes, or it feels very difficult to do, but if you keep doing it, it becomes easier. You know, like the learning driving. If you give up after first day, you know, it never becomes easier. But if you keep trying, driving again and again, then after a couple of years, it becomes really easy. It's a, what do you call, piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Mahamudra meditation is no problem. So therefore, <clears throat> this uh, meditation here, the key point here is non-distraction. Always having there's a sense of a thread of mindfulness. Thread of mindfulness with relaxation, with a sense of a space, and uh, relaxing at ease. You know, that becomes the key uh, instruction here. And it is the, uh, what you call, It's actually the um, essence of Mahamudra meditation. So, to engage in such Mahamudra meditation, there are a few techniques. Uh, there are many techniques we use, <clears throat> but here we have a verse, uh, we have some verses here. There are so, um, these three are cutting through suddenly arisen thoughts, resting uncontrived with whatever occurs, and being skilled in the essential points of resting. So these are the three key points, essential points of meditation here. Tangbo Tolji Bejul or Komia de Hajan Kaljambore, Kombayabu Yongo, the Kombayabundo. So, first, it's important for us to gain familiarity in this technique called cutting through sudden arisen thoughts. <coughs> We need to cut completely through suddenly arisen thoughts. Um, this technique, <clears throat> you may find or you may say it doesn't sound like Mahamudra cutting through suddenly arisen thoughts. Right? Mahamudra usually says, rest in the nature of thought, relax. But this method becomes very necessary for resting in the nature of thought. There is no way we can rest in the nature of thought without first engaging in this method as an ordinary practitioner. It is not possible. You know, all of those things we've been discussing sounds very nice, right? Rest, relax, in the nature of present thought, present emotion, present mind. You know, all the sounds really wonderful. But when we try to do it, it's a different story. <laughs> now, first of all, we have a hard time finding what is a present mind. You know, forget about resting in it. <laughs> or relaxing at ease. But at first we have a hard time finding what is this present mind we are talking about. And so this first method will help us to find the present mind. You know, to recognize 
the present mind. To, uh, it helps us to see the current, uh, current mind in front of us. And so therefore, when a thought arises, any thought, whether it's a positive thought or a negative thought, in that very moment, we must, or immediately, we must try to recognize that there is a thought. Right? Present thought. And we should not let it continue its uh, storyline. So what we should do rather is immediately cut through its momentum. <coughs> we should not allow the thought to um, continue in its discursiveness. And abruptly cut the suddenly arisen thought right on the spot. Cut and cut and cut again and again. So in order to do this uh, there are actually these instructions here in this verse that the first we must give rise to a determination, a strong determination in saying, I will not let any thought arise. We think to ourselves, I'm not going to let even one thought arise without embracing it with mindfulness. Yes, a strong determination. <clears throat> um, so what we need to do here is really put a lot of energy into <clears throat> our mindfulness. We need to boost our mindfulness very strongly. As soon as you say, I'm not going to allow any thought to arise. You know what happens. <laughs> you know what mind does. As soon as we say that, there will be hundreds of thoughts arising. You know, that's a nature. That's a nature. And this is described by Ninth Kamapa Wang Chu Dorje in his Mahamudra treatise. And he says, he gives this example that a person arrives to a village, a nice town. And he finds this town very beautiful, pleasant, very uh, wonderful condition and beautiful. And he loves this town and he wants to stay there for, stay there for a long time. That is a thought, he wants to stay there. And after a couple of days, a person comes there from the local authority, tells this person that the local authority does not want him to leave the town. You know, they want him to stay there for a while. As soon as he hears that, <laughs> they say, he said that this person will have only one thought. That is, how can I leave this town and when? You know, he doesn't want to stay there for another minute. But just before that message, he wants to settle down in that town for a while. It's a beautiful place. You know, that's the nature of our mind. So as soon as we say, no thoughts, there will be a lot of thoughts. So when there are a lot of thoughts, what happens? we have opportunity 
to recognize the arising of these thoughts. Namdo Jigdam, my dear by Jigging Sambegi Mishitan, or Tachu Bussem, Samta Jenny Tedan, they shook down the name. So when we have this firm resolve on the one hand to not allow any thoughts to arise and thoughts arising in multitude on the other hand we have these two things coming together this um, benefits our ability to recognize the rising stage of thought. Mm-hmm. So when in Mahamudra meditation instructions, the phrase, the mind of the present moment is used, this is referring to all of the thoughts and mental afflictions that are currently arising in our mind, but we're usually not able to recognize that stage of arising as it is happening. And through training in this first method, we become better at recognizing this. So it's taught that that's what this first technique accomplishes. Through generating the strong intention of, um, I'm not going to let any thoughts arise, we become more capable of recognizing the arising of thoughts. So, this technique of a Mahamudra is not to stop arising thoughts per se, but this technique is to help us recognize arising arising of each thought in present moment. Recognition of arising of our mind, present mind, is very difficult. And this is very important at the first stage. If we cannot recognize arising of these thoughts, and emotions, how can we rest in the present mind? It is not possible. So therefore, arising, recognition of these arising, arising of thoughts become very necessary at the beginning. So this is what this method is doing. And so within that state, when a thought arises all of a sudden, then we need to immediately cut through it. Cut. And the manner in which we cut is directly, completely. And when we say cut here, we're simply talking about not letting the thought continue or not sustaining the thought. Nothing more than that. Tele but aside from that, it's not like cutting a piece of rope and making something that was once long into something short. Mm-hmm. So cutting here means not continuing. The yang ne yang tu jiegu no, yang ne yang tu jiegu no, yang ne yang tu jiegu de ge kare pengi ras na nam dong ga pang ma xie wan pengi no. Am sem sem ji. So, 
we need to engage in this cutting over and over again. And when we cut like this over and over again, again, it helps us recognize the arising of our thoughts. And it also helps us recognize the ceasing of our thoughts. So when we actually cut through the thought, then we recognize the thought cessation as well. So the, this makes the recognition of cessation easier. So and when we do this, we'll find that when we cut through one thought, there's another thought that we need to cut through already. So we cut through that thought, and all of a sudden there's another thought that we need, another thought that we need to cut through. And this process continues until it feels like there, there is just so many thoughts that we need to cut through, and it's, we become overwhelmed by the multitude of our thoughts. <coughs> yes. Cutting one after the other, <clears throat> all these multitude of thoughts. Then at some point, it becomes too overwhelming, overwhelming. In which, this cutting continuously will lead us to experience, in some sense, a non-thought experience. Even though there is a multitude of thoughts, but there is no one clear concept to continue. And that experience of a multitude of thoughts, overwhelming experience of thoughts arising, is taught to be here as the first experience of recognizing the nature of mind. This is thought to be the first experience of resting mind, and it's likened to a steep waterfall. So the this type of waterfall is a very uh, strong and high and powerful waterfall, like Niagara Falls, for example. Something that's unceasing and very violent. <laughs> violent. <laughs> Aggressive. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> That's the first experience of resting. So you see, sometimes, you know, when we meditate, we have these experiences and we often give up sitting, thinking, oh, I cannot experience a calm mind. I have so many thoughts, too many thoughts arising. But from the meditation point of view, or the meditation instructions point of view, then this is the experience of resting. This is our first experience of resting. It's amazing that our first experience of resting is this experience of overwhelming thoughts. You know, when we cut one after another. It's overwhelming. Awesome. <clears throat> so now we will practice this technique together for a brief period.
So first we make a decisive commitment or pledge that we will not let even one thought arise. And then after we make that resolve, we can begin practicing the shamatha of focusing on the breath, which is a technique that we are familiar with. And while we are concentrating on the breath, if a thought arises, then we abruptly cut through that thought. Or what we could do is first focus our attention on the breath briefly, and then from there rest in the nature of our mind. Mahamudra. And from within that state, when thoughts arise, we cut through them abruptly. So we need to cut through completely any suddenly arisen thoughts.
Thank you. That day you're a Mugum God in the Manajina. So really, um, when we practice this, we need a longer session to become familiar with the technique. <clears throat> and we cut again and again. Abruptly cut through suddenly a risen thought. And uh, when we do that, the experience, overwhelming experience of thoughts uh, seemingly increasing number of thoughts but actually if you really look at it the number of thoughts is not really increasing thoughts are always momentary whether you cut it or not they are momentary. At this point, you are recognizing each moment or many of these moments with mindfulness. So it feels like it's increasing. You know, when is in actuality, it's not that they are increasing. <laughs> Namdo Koran Gaji Kiji Gijunja to Jawala Manu Mewarando. In terms of thoughts that are um, arising moment after moment, one following the other, there is no uh, more or less. Gaji Kere Namdo Koran. One moment only contains one thought. If we cut through the thought, that thought will have lasted for just one moment. And if we don't cut through the thought, then the thought will still have only lasted for one moment. <laughs> <laughs> so the cutting is just um, a situation of recognizing or not recognizing. It's a question of whether we recognize the arising and ceasing of thoughts or not. So the difference is um, having mindfulness and awareness and with that recognizing the arising and ceasing of our thoughts and not having mindfulness and awareness and from in that state of kind of dense or dark unawareness um, being completely governed by the thoughts. That's the only difference. So therefore, when you look at it Actually, we are not changing anything in terms of our thoughts, right? So this still, this method still stays in harmony with general Muhammad review, which means you don't need to change your thoughts, you don't need to transform, you just have to recognize their nature. You can't change it anyway their nature. And when we recognize the thoughts arising and ceasing in such a way, then thoughts become ornament. To our nature of mind, recognition of nature of mind. เดี๋ยวเราเป็นจังหวะทุบเราเป็นจังหวะจังก็ยากอีกเช่นตัวต่างเว้ยยามเช่นไรชั่วโมงจงเช่นเช่นบาดเดี๋ยวน้ำโต
Siddha, Sampa, Tampa Gavin. <laughs> Say or sang. When we look at the clear, bright ocean, and we could write this down as well. <laughs> when you look at the clear, bright ocean, And the waves rise up and dissolve back down. And the waves. And the waves rise up and dissolve back down. Don't you know this is the Lama teaching you? Don't you know this is the Lama teaching you? That thoughts are Dharmakaya. That thoughts are Dharmakaya. Dharmakaya means the ultimate wisdom of enlightenment. So again, I'll sing it once by myself because the melody is the same but slightly different than this morning. And then we'll all sing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. When <laughs> when you look at the clear bright ocean and the waves rise. When we realize the true nature of our thoughts, that is the Dharmakaya. The true nature of thoughts is the wisdom of enlightenment. If we know how to look nakedly at, rest directly within, and relax at ease within our thoughts of the present moment as they arise, then we will see and realize the wisdom of the Buddha. When waves surge in the ocean, 
they surge up from the ocean itself and they dissolve back into the ocean itself. They're inseparable from the ocean. And thoughts as well arise from the expanse of Dharmakaya and dissolve back into the expanse of Dharmakaya. They are inseparable. So we practice this first method, method of cutting through suddenly arisen thoughts in order to recognize the arising of thoughts, to recognize the cessation of thoughts, and to realize the true nature of thoughts. Yeah. <clears throat> Working with our thoughts become very important. Because all of our tendencies, habitual tendencies, and creation of samsara, our samsaric world, are mainly dependent on dualistic concepts, thoughts, create the samsara. If we can penetrate our thoughts, if we can discover the true nature of thoughts, then it will be possible for us to transcend the confusion of samsara and the illusion of samsara that we create all the time. Many of these things we, many of these things that give us the suffering and the pain are connected with the concepts. We project, we label, we conceptualize, and then they bring so much suffering, so much pain. We can see Sometimes, when we find out we made the wrong projections, right? Uh, we made uh, wrong projections on someone's idea about ourselves or something connected to us. And then we go on and on with the many labelings, all oh, this and all that, and then so much pain, so much suffering, you know, so much uh, uh, disturbance goes on and on for many hours. And then at the end, when you talk to this person directly, and talk about your projections, your thoughts, and when you realize that was not what this person was thinking or doing, you can see how all of those sufferings you have had in the past hours, you can see how we create our samsara. It is so clear. We can see how much suffering you know, we get from our concepts, such as our values. Our concept of values, it creates so much suffering so much pain. Uh, our projections, you know values also has a lot of projections. And a lot of cultural projections. You know, a lot of uh, psychological projections. A lot of our, uh, what do you call? Um, um, ethnic. You know, projections on these values. 
And from there, you know, we get so much suffering. You know, just because we misunderstand each other, each other's value creates so much suffering. You know, at the end, there's not much difference sometimes. But when we hold on to something, and when we have so much fear and hope built on such conceptual clinging, you know, then, uh, then the suffering actually gets greater and greater. Yeah. Especially when there's such a rigid <coughs> fixation uh, onto our concepts and thoughts. And that's why that in Milarepa, um, in many of Milarepa's psalms, he speaks of samsara as being merely a thought. That samsara is something just created by our thoughts. And also in the Madhyamaka system, samsara is taught to be a thought, it's taught to be a mere conceptual imputation. So we can see here that all vehicles are in agreement on this point. In the Hinayana context, samsara is karma, and karma is traced back to the mind. Samsara is created by karma, and what is the karma? Then it's traced back to our mind, motivation, intention, our thought. When we talk about karma in Buddhism, it's not just a physical action. Most important action takes place in our mind, thought. The motivation, as we call, or intention, that creates the actual karma. So when you see, actually the samsara can be transformed or recognize the nature of samsara when we can recognize the nature of our thoughts. So working with our thought becomes extremely powerful and necessary. Necessary. So therefore this method is a very valuable method. And when we say work with our thought, then the first thing we need to do is we need to recognize our thoughts. Isn't it? And how do we recognize our thoughts? We have to recognize when they are rising. You know, when they are rising, how they are rising, what is it that's arising, and when they are ceasing. You know, that's what we need to recognize here. And that's what this first method is doing, helping us to recognize. So, for the remainder of the day, um, after we part ways here, if you have time to practice this technique at home, then that would be good. And if you don't, then um, all of us can practice it together before tomorrow morning's teaching session. <coughs> Now we will sing the song of Nilareka called the song of Mahamudra. Which is on page seven of the hand handouts. And after that, 
if there are any questions, you can ask them. <laughs> At the time I meditating on Mahamudra, I wrestling I struggled in actual real me. I rest relaxing and free from wandering space. I rest on the clarity cradle of an emptiness space. I rest in awareness and this is blissful space. I rest unruffled in non-conceptual space. In variety space I rest in equipoise and resting like this is near in mind itself. A wealth of certainty manifests endlessly without even trying self-luminous mind is at work. Not stuck in expecting results, I'm doing okay. No dualism, no hopes and fears, oh hey. Delusion has wisdom now that's being cheerful and bright. Delusion transformed into wisdom now that's all Yes, one, two, three. <laughs> Here. Thank you very much for wonderful teaching and present. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what is the relationship between thoughts and or mind and our body. Mm -hmm. Because there is some relation with certain thoughts that I want to speak and suddenly my heart beats rise. Uh, it's not really, I don't know what thought arises, but I sense it in my body. Mm -hmm. So it seems like to catching these thoughts to when they arise, there's some kind of relationship with the body. Mm -hmm. but I'm not very clear, but you know. Right. <clears throat> Mind and body. <laughs> Interesting topic. Um, generally speaking, from the Buddhist point of view, you know, body is a very strong support you know for our consciousness for our mind and the body has the elements that can give different experiences to our mind like perceptual experiences like how we see how we hear and so on you know it's a consciousness but based on physical uh, sense organs and so therefore body uh, definitely has a very strong um, support a role of a support for mind at the same time they are not the same from the Buddhist point of view mind and body are two separate uh, elements That's the first general view. And the secondly, when we get into Vajrayana context, then it gets a little bit more interesting at the same time complex. Uh, because of Vajrayana view, then we talk about a subtle body. 
you know, that subtle body is not physical body, but the true essence of the body. And that subtle body and mind are uh, not different. Resonate with each other, so they're in the same state, the body and mind. Mm-hmm. And because you temporarily, yes. Right, temporarily. Uh, like a prana, especially like the prana. Uh, prana. Wind or energy. Wind or energy of the body has a strong impact on mind. You know, depending on, depending on how the wind is moving, you know, it changes mind or thought, movement. And so there's a strong connection between body and mind. Uh, and still it's a, it is a temporary, you know, body and mind relation is quite a temporary. Because let's say if anything happens to our body, sense organs, and so on, you know, mind changes. You know, we lose that. And vice versa, if something happens to our mind, our body changes, right? Yes. Yes, that's right. <coughs> You're welcome. I think there was a dedicated issue of Shambhala Sun recently on this topic, mind-body connection. I also contributed an article there. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I have. I don't want to make this um, philosophical too much. <laughs> there are two words that. So there's talk and talk, and then we end up saying two words. It seems that are sort of end words, and the words are nature and essence. <laughs> so talk and talk and talk, and then the nature of life. And then, you know, the thoughts and the I are inseparable in their essence. And that always seems to be, um, in the teachings like Edward, we stop there to go on to the next. Uh, so, Two words, uh-huh. Yeah. So, in American schools, you say, could you compare and contrast? <laughs> <laughs> uh, compare and contrast, uh-huh. Yeah. Nature and essence, or even better, perhaps, help us uh, by pointing to how to understand nature and how to understand essence so that our practice is um, better. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Wow. Uh, so these two are uh, synonyms in most cases. There's all different there's different contexts in which they can be used in different ways. But in Mahamudra, essence and nature are basically synonyms. Many times. It's used as uh, synonyms. They have the same meaning. <clears throat> Basically referring to the, the actual state, or the true state of thought, mind, what have you. You know, it's called essence or nature. But if you explain these two, or when we use them separately, differently, Then essence refers primarily to the empty aspect, the aspect of emptiness. Uh, Or selflessness. No, egoless essence. When we penetrate, look at the essence of a thought, and we don't find anything solid anything substantial, you know, that kind of thing, essence. 
and the nature. Um, refers to when they're separated out. Um, refers to luminosity or clarity. The nature of thought. You know, when you look at the thought's nature, it's not just uh, blank. Mm -hmm. It's not just uh, uh, shunya, empty. But it has a lot of uh, luminous quality, display. You know, that's nature. So that's uh, most of the time it's in Dzogchen teaching. These are separately used, like essence being empty, nature being luminous, and so on. Uh, it's also done in Mahamudra, but most commonly in Mahamudra they are used interchangeably. Does that help? <clears throat> so, so nature is more closely associated with Bhakti and the essence with the moon, or is that just taking a step too far? Hmm. No, both are dandam. Okay. okay. Yeah, absolute. Both are absolute in this context. But you know, if you, whenever we say luminosity, many, many times we think it's little relative. Mm -hmm. But it's not, you know, it's, it's talking about a true state. <clears throat> It's just a bad habit. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't think uh, if it's clear about the Sanskrit term for Dzogchen is found I don't know if we have found any old scriptures you know, using the Sanskrit terminology of Dzogchen. But if you translate it directly, it's not Mahaati, it's Mahasandhi. Yeah, Mahasandhi. So you could use say, you could say, you know, Ma Mudra and Mahasandhi. So I think it's not so commonly found in the scriptures of the Sanskrit terminology of Dzogchen. So that's why I think uh, most translators and teachers are using uh, Tibetan term. All right, then Lama <laughs> After that, here and then there. Yes. Yes. You commented on this Yeah. You commented on how about not doing. And just relaxing the window and resting in the line. <clears throat> and some non fabrication or non contrivance. Mm -hmm. So, could you, um, because a lot of people have confusion or it's a little complicated to understand when you're doing Chayrim or development stage practice, creative stage practice, how you integrate Mahamudra and not doing, uh, not fabricating with um, creation stage practice. Nang tong gang tuk ta ba tu jie li ma in Mahamudra it said that the actual practice of the creation stage is thoughts that are beyond adopting and rejecting. Nang tong. Nang tong. Gang tuk ta. Oh, sorry. Uh, not thoughts that are beyond adopting and rejecting, <laughs> but appearance <clears throat> of adopting and rejecting. You know, appearance, emptiness, inseparable. Beyond accepting or rejecting. That's creation stage. And that's what we do in the, the deity visualization. Rest in appearance, emptiness. 
luminosity emptiness forms uh, resting in that form relaxing at ease and then seeing the whole world surrounding environment in such a form of appearance emptiness so to create that uh, kind of realization of appearance emptiness then Vajrayana is using more uh, what you call forceful more forceful methods whereas if you say now okay visualize all these forms or appearance emptiness and your body is appearance emptiness if we do that of course it's a little bit uh, for some maybe it's easy but many it is still difficult like you know when I see oh this is so and so you know and so forth and so on a lot of concepts come but whereas when you visualize into a, a deity a symbolic image right the deity image is already uh, metaphoric and so it's not necessarily the image itself is so important but the metaphoric symbolism symbolism of the image is very important and so is the mandala so when you visualize it it's like you're suddenly cutting our ordinary clinging and suddenly connecting with the appearance emptiness of home so therefore in Kamparamacha's teaching it says Nang Tong Gal Rup Thawa That the creation stage is appearance emptiness beyond adopting and rejecting Yeah, Rambuja said that So, uh, yes, in Mahamudra view creation stage is nothing more than appearance, resting in appearance emptiness nature beyond adopting and rejecting if we can do that with any form, that is a creation stage practice. Even this form of ordinary body, ordinary world, if we can do that, that's a creation stage. So if we cannot do that even with a deity visualization, it is not become real creation stage. You know. Does that uh, make sense? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, there, yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Bishop. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could help me with the clarification about looking nakedly mm -hmm. and the essence of thoughts. When I first heard it from you, I was thinking I was looking nakedly um, so that I could rest in the absolute nature of thoughts. But as I listened to the question earlier, and I began to wonder, am I looking nakedly to rest in the relative nature of thoughts, you know, like seeing aggression as aggression, or do I want to penetrate that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, it, it is a two-stage process. You know, two-stage process that first we recognize a relative thought, right, a rising of a thought, and what thought it is, or cessation of a thought. You know, that's a very important first. And then we must penetrate further. You know, penetrate further to rest in its essence. You know, essence of that thought, which is beyond a label. Uh, so good. So what we're trying to do is engage in a method where we can um, rest in the simplicity nature of the thought itself. The rest in the actual fabric of the thought that is of the nature of simplicity. You know, taste it. Taste it as essence. <clears throat> You're welcome. You mentioned this morning that the, the guru is like a mirror. Uh huh. Do you think that the guru needs to be enlightened to be like a mirror? And uh, if a, a disciple looks for a guru, how does that disciple know that the guru is enlightened? <laughs> Good question. Are you enlightened? <laughs> Well, that's a very easy question, no. 
Uh, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> the first question is harder than the second one. <laughs> second is so vivid, the answer. <laughs> Big no. <laughs> um, actually, the mirror, the guru, does not necessarily have to be fully enlightened being because in the scriptures it is taught that there there can be three kinds of teachers spiritual friends ordinary being spiritual friends a realized this spiritual friend like bodhisattvas on the bhumis and completely enlightened spiritual friend like nirmanakaya buddha and so any of these three masters is fine uh, for a disciple. Of course, realized master, like Bhumis, Bodhisattva on the Bhumis, or the Buddha, completely enlightened master, you know, these two are easy to, to define their qualities. But what is difficult is ordinary being. Ordinary being. Um, Ordinary being, spiritual masters, qualifications are described in Shanti Deva's Bodhicharya Avatara. I think it's this is uh, quite a simple. I like this description. Um, it's not so complicated. Takpara gave a shiny name, take chin, don't a cabadon. Chang Chu Sembe, do shu cho, so we jay amadon. He says that um, a spiritual friend of the Mahayana should be learned in the Mahayana teachings and should never discard the conduct of the Mahayana even at the risk of his or her life. Yeah, that's the qualification of a spiritual friend in Mahayana as an ordinary person. You know, one who, um, one who is learned in all the scriptures, especially in Mahayana scripture, and one who is abiding by Mahayana precept, which means loving kindness, compassion, and practicing the paramitas, six paramitas, you know, uh, very firmly, even at the risk of his or her life, that will be their practice. So, you know, ordinary being possessing these qualities are said to be qualified spiritual friend in Mahayana. And in Vajrayana, Mela Rebbe said, Lame Tsinyi Jubandans. The definition of a guru is one who has a lineage. Mela Rebbe said, in Vajrayana, on top of that Mahayana qualities, you know, what we need another extra quality to be a Vajrayana guru is one who has a lineage you know, lineage transmission and blessings, and one who has a strong connection to the lineage. So these are the qualities of a spiritual friend in ordinary, ordinary being spiritual friends. So when you see these qualities, right, these are easy, like uh, learn it or not is easy. You know, you ask some questions, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, compassionate or not, you know, practicing Mahayana, having Vajrayana lineage or not. You know, these things we have to analyze if the Guru has these qualities or not. If the Guru is from the first Bhumi to tenth Bhumi Bodhisattvas, then it's easy to recognize, I'm sure. We won't have any uh, doubts about it. Or even Nirmanakaya Buddha is like, I uh, can't miss it. <laughs> Right, his qualities. So, you know, these are the qualities of a spiritual friend. Does that help your question? No. You're welcome. Then here now. <clears throat> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, I have two questions about the nature of thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. The, the metaphor of um, ocean with arisings and fallings, mm -hmm. thoughts as they come and go, is very, 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 very clear to me. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but in trying to understand the nature, the, the water nature of ocean. Water nature of ocean. Of thoughts. Mm -hmm. In other words, the ocean in this metaphor. Mm -hmm. I wonder if, if, um, if luminosity, um, awakeness, is a way of getting at what the ocean nature of that metaphor is. Mm -hmm. Is that awakeness, luminosity, is that fair? Yes, definitely, oh. definitely. And also, <clears throat> the ocean nature uh, usually also has the quality of a shunyata, yes. you know, egolessness, emptiness. So basically, egoless, emptiness, quality of wakefulness is the nature of the ocean. And whereas the, the luminosity quality is like the waves, you know, they're beautiful and manifesting. I understand, that's very mm -hmm. helpful. The other is maybe a technical question. Um, I, I wonder, I, I do understand that even the most um, minute action generates karma. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder if a thought that isn't acted upon mm -hmm. generates karma. Can, can a thought by itself not generate karma? No. No, usually not. It is taught that usually it, um, in order a karma to be complete, you need, uh, you need these four... Axioms. Huh? Axioms. Yeah. Uh, to be complete. Tangod is yi tangod. Le tamsa ki yi karim ba yulti. Sebo gondo. Oh, nga ki min dilen jek nyo jek yi sandu. Shi cha. Then you buy the samba, samba them sabo, make a coron and then they new jiggings. Then you somebody in Jorwa, then they support them, loot and market, then they let Jorwa. Then she bought the tartoos. Tartoo the garrison, like a jets are new jets are coron, a duma yons are up to tartoos, did you let the zoba? Thing on a lady mazoba. Chidan get all the jay lady casual, the Pagjala, Pagjala new yesterday, Pagjaja. So, it's not that we need to have these four actions or four elements complete in order, for, in order for our karmic action to be complete. And this, these four were taught by Buddha in the sutras. The first one is to have a basis for or object of the action. So in a case of um, an act of aggression, you need to have, for example, a person that you want to harm. And it has to be clear, a clearly isolated object. So it's like this person you want to do um, harm to. And the second is that you need to have the intention, the, the thought in your mind, I'm going to harm this person. Third, you need um, the actual engagement in the action. Lumak. And that, that's when the body or speech comes into play. And then fourth, you need completion of that action. So you, that action has to be successfully um, completed with respect to the object. So that's when the, the person has actually received the effect of your physical and verbal action towards him or her. Then <laughs> Um, number one, without having these four completed, if, if at any point in this um, process the whole thing stops before you get to number four, then it's not a complete karmic action. Mm -hmm. But even further, the Buddha taught that it has to be completed before you die. Um, so if you die before number before you get to number four, then it's not considered a complete karmic action. Like, you know, if you have uh, tried to kill someone and you die before the other person dies, <laughs> uh, then karma is not complete, yeah. So, 
So the Buddha taught about this, um, <laughs> these principles of karma in the Vinaya sutras, the sutras on monastic discipline, which are basically, in, in some, in a lot of cases, uh, they rule books. Really. It's a little bit like a law. Law book. <laughs> Well, this would seem to, to point to what you were saying earlier about the, um, the real distinction between mind and body. Mm -hmm. um, because every bodily movement is an action. Right. And, but thoughts, as you said, don't necessarily generate karma. That's right. But you, most of the time, the thoughts actually instigate. Right. physical action right. so they are the in some sense the main agent right. you know uh, most of the time it's like you know thought gives the command and then the body executes one thing I forgot to add that uh, Richard did say is the thoughts um, help to generate habitual tendencies yes. but they might not um, generate karma mm -hmm. thank you that's very helpful you're welcome can, uh, oh, there was a one somewhere there. Yes, first. Sorry. Mm -hmm. You said yesterday. Yesterday. Yes. And I see that this can happen in any moment. Right. And my question, I'm trying to phrase it. I guess if I could phrase it, I would probably get the answer. Mm -hmm. so, um, is, in my understanding of what I have read or heard being said, is that the moment is also, any moment is also empty. Like there's no beginning, middle, <laughs> <or> end. <laughs> um, That's right. Clever Madhyamaka notion. Right. Um, if, this enlightenment happens, can happen in any given moment. Is this a sustainable, I'm using an awful word, but... Mm -hmm. is, is this experience sustainable? Is the experience sustainable? Mm -hmm. um, or is it also, in this <laughs> my relative level of understanding, um, arises and ceases? Mm -hmm. or, then is it enlightenment, or is it just the beginning of some minor breakthrough into recognition of what you said, a phenomenon and the nature of mind? Miniature enlightenment. <laughs> uh -huh. What then is the absolute, what is absolute enlightenment? Could you yes. explain, I mean, could you tell me about it? <laughs> I know it's not conceptual, I know it's ineffable, but... Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try. I'm really interested. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> um, First of all, experience of nature of mind as being the Buddha mind, the enlightened mind, can arise as a flash experience, <coughs> like a flash, short, uh, momentary. It's sustainable, but still requires effort at the beginning. And once you have that flash, to sustain becomes easier because you have a lot of um, strong encouragement you know, from having this experience. And so therefore, um, this experience, even though it's a flash experience, it is extremely powerful and valuable experience. And so it comes first as a flash, momentary, short. But if you keep continuing to connect with that nature of mind again and again with these different methods of Mahamudra and Dzogchen, 
<laughs> or Mahasandhi. <laughs> then, you know, then we can recognize, you know, recognize the true nature of mind and give rise to true realization. And that realization, when the realization of true nature of mind comes, then it is not it is not a momentary flash experience, but it is ultimate, ultimate experience. It's unchangeable. And that unchangeable realization, when it further continues, then it becomes what we call enlightenment, a complete enlightenment. A glimpse of enlightenment can come early, but a complete enlightenment uh, comes with some effort. You know, like Mila Repa did practice very hard. Before he was hit on the forehead by his teacher's spiritual. Oh, Naropa, oh yes. <coughs> yes, Naropa did, yes, definitely. He did study a lot and became a great scholar and then left that and became student of Telopa and also practiced in a very form informal way, but he did work hard. <laughs> Pretty hard. So no shortcuts. Well, to to get a glimpse is a shortcut, you know, and to get this experience, you know, within a short period of time, is a shortcut. Uh, whereas in other uh, in other situations where you know it takes long time to even get such glimpse long time to get even such realization, you know, long time to even, you know, recognize one's mind's nature, you know. So it's already a shortcut and it can be shorter too. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, one and two. Thank you, mm -hmm. I have a question about devotion. In the beginning of your book, you talk a lot about the importance of devotion, Mahamudra and its relationship to other emotions that arise within mm -hmm. one works with. And there's an experience that, to me, that the devotion sometimes really opens up into the view, and sometimes it kind of collapses, well, it collapses into like, like a fiery sort of attachment. You know, there can be a lot of attachment with the devotion. And so my question is, when that's happening in practice, um, what's skillful to do with that? Sometimes it feels like, you know, that I want to get rid of that to get back to a more open experience of the devotion. And yet that arises a lot, this kind of fiery, I mean, it, it brings a lot of energy to practice and it brings me in, but it's also kind of a, um, it's a ta you know, it has a sort of a dualistic aspect in, in more than the other. So I just wanted to know what the same Working with such attachment, you know, working with such uh, experience of uh, devotion going up and down. You know, I usually say devotion is like, uh, what do you call that? Price chart. Price chart. <laughs> Stock chart. You know, or uh, hard monitor. Some of that, you know. It's good when it's going up and down. Isn't it? The flat screen is not good. <laughs> It's good when it's moving. Any direction is fine, <laughs> as long as it's moving. And so, therefore, you know, devotion itself, you know, going through such experience of high and low, you know, attachment and openness itself becomes our path. You know, when we can work with that, there is a tremendous intensity, power, you know, uh, genuine power and intensity to really click into a state that goes beyond, you know, beyond such duality. And so, therefore, personally speaking, my experience of working with the devotion 
is that not always smooth you know not always uh, uh, a nice experience not always uh, like a beautiful but that itself in itself is the beauty of devotion you know that uh, quality of ruggedness yeah, quality of rawness and a quality of intensity of emotions arising in attachment uh, passion uh, jealousy aggression and so on and it's a very very powerful journey and when one can work with that you know then we can work with any emotion you know this is a very sacred environment a uh, sacred emotion here You're welcome. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I watch my mind, I, I see this relentless tendency to try to make things better, to improve things, to things. Mm -hmm. is, is that Is that what you mean by fabrication or trupa? Mm -hmm. Trupa, so yes. Is it correct that simply ceasing that relentless fabrication is all that there is to be done to realize the nature of mind, to realize ordinary mind? In a general sense of uh, wanting to improve is uh, nothing wrong. But if we are getting attached to it, you know, then it becomes obstacles to the path. And so therefore, when we see such a clinging or thought arising in our practice in everyday life, you know, first thing we should try is try to remember that our nature of mind is all, already pure, already complete, already uh, full of uh, Buddha qualities. There's nothing missing. And there's nothing outside to look for. There's nothing to improve and nothing to uh, solve. Get rid of. Yeah, nothing to get rid of. So remember that view as it is taught in Mahayana, Mahamudra teachings, and then try to connect with the ordinary mind. Thank you. And if, if I look at what seems to be behind this all of us uh, fabrication, mm -hmm. there's this kind of pervasive human suffering. And then, but beyond that, I mean, conceptually, there's the society that we live in in which we're being more, you know, self improvement and all that. But then I was surprised to find one other thing, which is that Buddha Dharma itself, as I've come to understand it, leads to this grounds and paths that so much to be achieved in Mahamudra, the four yogas. <laughs> and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how we keep in mind that there is something to be achieved in this moment, not to, not to fabricate, not to comprise anything. Right. There is a, a quote um, from the Mahamudra teachings that says, um, in the context of all accomplishing Mahamudra itself, <coughs> to count paths and boomies is illusion. So, from the actual perspective of Mahamudra, there is only one path, one bhumi, and that's Mahamudra itself. And beyond that, if you try to add other levels of paths and bhumis and the idea of um, progression, then that's <coughs> delusion. That's from the Mahamudra itself, in a point of view, ultimate point of view. And the reason why we have so many levels, right, like for yogas, of Mahamudra, ten Bhumis, and so on. You know, these are because of our relative, relative mind, you know, relative development. Uh, our mind, our defilement is complicated. So therefore there is a path to transcend such complicated defilement. 
Right, the true nature, true essence of mind is a simple. It doesn't need all those counting and levels. But because of complications, we need these remedies. You know, so these paths and levels are reflecting or working with our uh, defilements, our confusion. That's complicated. That's well, we have many layers built many layers of, of uh, clashes and habitual tendencies built over many uh, years, <laughs> so to speak. And in order to <clears throat> overcome or transcend or undo or penetrate, you know, all of these layers of complications or defilements, then there are these different layers of practices introduced. That's why, like Mayamaka, for example, it's very similar to Mayamaka, like emptiness. From the Mayamaka point of view, it's simple. It's just emptiness, shunyata, that's it. But when we say it's just shunyata, it doesn't make any sense. Right? For us, it doesn't work. We need more uh, layers of reasoning and logic to, uh, to prove that theory. And so therefore, in order to overcome different misunderstandings of this true, simple nature of shunyata, egolessness, you know, then we have these complicated logical reasonings and a theory, a theoretical you know, process of Mahayamaka teaching. It's the same with my Mahamudra. And so therefore, when we practice Mahamudra, these four yogas are actually reflecting or relating to our experiences, you know, as we gain on the path. It's not necessarily like we have to look for the next one, but as we keep going on, as we keep practicing and connecting with our ordinary mind, you know, Tamad Jisheba, uh, Mahamudra mind, then these experiences naturally arise. And, and change and goes through four yogas. And so if a practitioner wants to check like how one's practice is going and then these four yoga teachings, for example, becomes a good kind of lamji chun A good postmark on the path. You know. But we should not get uh, caught up in this idea like, you know, I have to now reach the first yoga, and then now I've reached the second yoga, not like that. You. You're welcome. So thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you. We'll stop here this evening. <clears throat>